Welcome back. It's good to have you. I'm excited about today. I got a good message. We're going to be talking about the sovereignty of God. And today I'm going to be using a lot of scripture throughout all of the Bible. But, and I'm going to be talking about the story of Joseph from Genesis 37 through chapter 50. So I've got a lot of scripture I'm going to be using. But the main place I'll be coming from today, I'll be coming out of Genesis 37 through 50, talking about the life of Joseph. But I don't have like one specific passage except for out of Genesis 45 and Genesis 50 that I'll be using. So if you wanted to go ahead and start turning there, I'll go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you. And we're just so thankful for the God that you are. We just love you and we praise you for the who you are. And that's what, air, that's what matters. It's about who you are. And Father, today I just hope that you open, pray that you open our hearts and our minds to hear about who you are when it comes to your sovereignty and what your sovereignty means for us in our lives. We thank you and we love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, like I said, I'm excited about today's attribute that we're going to be talking about. In this series called Knowing God, and I can't think of a more important series for the church and for individual believers to hear about. And if I were to single out one, the one major issue with any, with any church, it would be this. There are too many people and too many churches that do not have a high and lifted up view of who God is. They don't see the beauty and majesty of who He is. A.W. Tozer says this, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Tozer would go on to say this, The gravest question before us and the church is always God himself. Always the most revealing thing about us and the church is our idea of who God is. Until we see a vision of God high and lifted up, there will be no woe, there will be no burden, there will be no awe of who he is. Listen to this one. The first step down for any man or for any church is taken when we surrender our high view of who God is. The only thing I can say about this comment of Tozer from almost 60 years ago is amen and amen. See, wrong thoughts about God will have devastating results in our lives. What you think about God affects and shapes your whole relationship with Him. And listen to this. What you believe God thinks about you will determine how close you grow towards Him. So how do we have a right view of God that is high and lifted up? We do it by studying the most important topic of all, and that's studying who God is. Studying the attributes of God. <clears throat> and an attribute is simple. It's something that is true about God. Last week I said... I said that we can talk about God's different attributes individually. But the one thing I need you to remember throughout this whole series and right from the start, all of his attributes are who he is. There is not one attribute that is more important than any other. We may talk about them individually, but you must remember he is all his attributes all the time. And last week we started with the goodness of God. Out of all the attributes... Out of, out of all God's attributes, this is the one God chose to show Moses, Moses before they set out from Mount Sinai to the promised land full of hostile enemies. Before they were to cross through the hot and dry desert, before anything else, the Lord wanted Moses and the people to know that he is good. God is good. There is nothing to be added on to that statement, and there's nothing that can change that statement. Since the unchangeable God is good, then the only way he can act is from his goodness. And who are the objects of, his, of God's goodness? We are, you and me. By his very nature, he can't help but be good to us. What does all this mean? It's very simple. It means that God is so for us. No matter what we do, he can only act from his goodness towards us. So how should we respond to the goodness of God? One, we should turn to him. That's what the word repent means. Turn, repent, turn to God. Second, we respond to the goodness of God by finding rest and peace in his goodness. And third, we respond to the goodness of God by stepping out in faith, knowing 
that no matter what comes our way, no matter what happens, whatever somebody says to us or what somebody's going to do to us, nothing is going to happen outside of his goodness. He's only got good things in store for us. And as I begin to talk today about today's attribute, I want to start off with this. When it comes to my child's education and the teacher he has, I look for one thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, I want his teacher to be knowledgeable in what they teach. Yes, I want his teacher to have high expectations. Yes, I want his teacher to be kind and helpful. But the most important thing I look for in a teacher is this. I want my son's teacher to have control of their classroom. If there's no control in the classroom, no learning will take place because the teacher will always be dealing with organizational and behavioral problems. When it comes to God, I want you to listen to this list of who he is from Scripture. God is before all things. He created all things. He upholds all things, is above all things. He knows all things, can do all things. He rules over all things and is in control of all things. From kings and presidents to human events to nature to the angels and even Satan and the demons. In other words, God is the sovereign God of the universe. He is in control. If God wasn't in control, he wouldn't be worthy of all praise and glory. Whatever may came up, come up, God's not surprised by it. Whatever strength is required to do something, he's got enough. When it comes to making the best possible decision, he knows what's best from his wisdom and his knowledge. God created his kingdom from nothing, and he is in still, and he still is in control of his kingdom. No one or nothing could ever dethrone him as king of kings and lord of lords, and he will never surrender control of his kingdom. That's the sovereign God of the Bible, the, the God that is still in control of his universe. So, the question becomes, how do we define the sovereignty of God? The dictionary defines sovereignty as this. Sovereignty means being above and superior to all others. In other words, the chief, the greatest, the supreme. Supreme in power, rank, and authority. Holding the position of a ruler, excellent and outstanding, one who possesses authority and power over all. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, this is what we mean. When we say God is sovereign, we declare, listen to this definition, we declare that by virtue of his creatorship over all life and all reality and his all-knowing, all-powerful and benevolent good rule that he is in fact king of kings and lord of lords. And listen to this. And he is in absolute control of all time and all eternity. Nothing will come into my life. The sovereignty of God says this. Nothing will come into my life today that he didn't either allow or decree for my ultimate good. The sovereignty of God tells us that God orchestrates all things for our good according to his purposes and his plans for his glory. In other words, there are no accidents. There are no coincidences when it comes to the sovereign God, Yahweh. As believers, we cannot believe in accidents and coincidence and still say God is sovereign. It's a contradiction. You can't do it. His sovereignty tells us that he is involved in the big and in the small things of your life all the way down to the fine details. And how has God revealed his sovereignty to us? First, he reveals his sovereignty to us through his titles throughout all of Scripture. Listen to some of the things that God, Yahweh, calls himself. He calls himself the Sovereign Lord, the Most High God, the Alpha and the Omega, the Beginning and the End, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And these are some pretty big claims, and only a sovereign God could back these claims up. Second, he reveals his sovereignty, sovereignty through his promises. Listen to a couple of his promises in Scripture. First, in Romans 8, 28, Paul says, He is the God that is working all things out for the good of those that love him. And in Philippians 2, Paul says that at his name, that his name is the name above every other name, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Think about those two promises, and all the other promises throughout all of Scripture. 
Think about that for a second. How could anyone ever promise these things unless they are sovereign and can make them happen? The third way that God reveals his sovereignty through, to us <clears throat> is through prophecy. Have you ever stopped to think about scripture and prophecy? Over a third of all the scripture is prophecy. Wow, that's a lot. Daniel, in his prophecies, in his book, has some of the most complete and detailed prophecy in all of Scripture about future events. God, throughout the history of the world, has told us of things that were going to take place. God, through prophecy, has been 100% accurate. Only a sovereign God could ever state what is going to happen in the future with 100% accuracy. The fulfillment of past prophecy gives us assurance that he will be 100% accurate in the prophecies that are yet to take place. And that's some good news. And then fourth, and this is where I'm going to spend most of my time today. Fourth, God reveals his sovereignty through people. And I want to use the life of Joseph to show you the sovereign God. And this is the story of Joseph. You see, Joseph was the 11th born of Jacob. And after the death of Rachel, Jacob's first and true love, Joseph, the eleventh born to Jacob, he was treated as the firstborn. Yes, this made his older brothers angry. In Genesis 37, Joseph has two dreams. One was of his brothers one day but bowing before Joseph. His older brothers bowing before Joseph. The second was of his father, mother, and his brothers bowing before Joseph. And of course, Joseph, he couldn't keep quiet about the dreams. When he told his brothers, they only hated him more. His father, Jacob, rebuked him, but kept in mind the dreams. One day, his, Jacob sent Joseph to check on the brothers. See, Joseph was the tattletale. Not only was he the favorite, but he was the tattletale. That only thing made things worse. Joseph makes his way to his brothers, wearing the coat of many colors. Just a little reminder to his brothers that he was daddy's favorite. Well, Joseph, you know the story. He ended up at the bottom of the pit and was sold into slavery. Pause right there and think for a minute. Do you think your family is messed up? This was the definition of a dysfunctional family. Also, I can guarantee you that Joseph didn't wake up that morning thinking this. Yes, today is the day I get thrown into the pit. I will be sold into slavery by my own brothers, and my life will be one train wreck after another. I'm so excited. Let's get this day started. I guarantee you that's not a bit of what. And if Joseph knew what was coming, he probably would have covered up and just stayed in bed for the rest of the day. You see, the attacks that come our way, those pits that come our way, they usually come out of nowhere, and they're unexpected. But Joseph had one thing to hold on to as he grew up in Egypt. God had already shown Joseph what the future held. And that's some pretty good news. And stop right there and think. If we don't keep in mind the many precious promises God has given to us through his word, what hope, what assurance do we have? Over the next 13 years, Joseph clinged to, the, to God who he was, and to the dreams that he had as a teenager. And over those 13 years in Egypt, Joseph was put in charge over all of Potiphar's house. He was accused of rape by Potiphar's wife and put in prison for something he didn't do. Joseph was put in charge of the prisoners he was with, and he interpreted the dreams of the Pharaoh's butler and baker. And those interpretations came to pass, by the way. He was left for two years in prison because the butler forgot all about Joseph until the Pharaoh had a dream. Joseph was called upon to interpret Pharaoh's dream after 13 years of captivity. Joseph, because of the interpretation and because of what God was doing, went from being in the outhouse to the White House. He was made, in second, he was made, second, made second in command of all of Egypt and was put in charge of gathering supplies for the coming famine. In time, Jacob, Joseph's father, sent his brothers to Egypt to get food because the, the famine was so severe in the land. Finally, Joseph's brothers come to him and bow before Joseph. And eventually, Jacob brings 70 Hebrew people from Canaan to Egypt where the family 
<coughs> excuse me, where the family all bows before Joseph, just like God had shown Joseph in his dreams years earlier. Eventually, what would happen is, Moses would lead over two million people out of Egypt and lead them toward the promised land. Joshua would lead them into the promised land. And after centuries, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, would be born from this family line. And the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 came true, that all the nations of the world would be blessed through the seed of Abraham. Joseph's brothers, when he revealed himself to them, they were scared. This is our brother that we threw into a pit and sold into slavery. We haven't seen him since. He is now second in command of the most powerful empire in the world. But the response of Joseph, Joseph tells us that Yahweh is the sovereign God. Listen to what Joseph says to his brothers from Genesis chapter 45, verses 7 and 8. And God, Joseph tells his brothers, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. It was not you that sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. God sent me here. You may have thrown me into the pit and sold me into slavery, but all of this, it is the work of God. You see, God trained and prepared me in Potiphar's house to learn how to manage the business of his household so that when I was put in charge of all of Egypt, I'd be prepared to run it. God trained me in prison how to deal with the most unruly people you could imagine so that I would be prepared to deal with people that had no food during the famine. You may have thrown me into the pit and sold me as a slave, but God took me, molded, and shaped me for this very reason. This is all according to his plan. God knew what he was doing. God knew that one day, through me, your brother Joseph, he would save his chosen people. And then Joseph, in, in Genesis 50, reassures his brothers, after the death of their father, that they have nothing to worry about. And he basically says, God is in control of the situation. He never meant any harm for you or me. As a matter of fact, God is working all things out for our good. Listen to what Joseph says to his brothers in Genesis 50, verse 20. It's a verse you all have heard before. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. That is a picture of the sovereign God. He is working all things out for the good of those that love him according to his purposes and his plans. God knows what he's doing. Oh, and by the way, God can only do what is good. Why? Because as we talked about last week, God is good. So the question becomes this. How do we respond to the sovereign God? First, all we can do is bow before him in absolute surrender. What else can we do? There is nothing that can stop the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, sovereign God of the universe. All we can do is surrender to him and his sovereignty. Second, we should behold the majesty and the beauty of who he is. And third, listen to this one. We must believe that everything that comes into our lives is either allowed or decreed by the sovereign God that can only do what is good and best for you and me according to his purposes. God can only do what is good and best for us, and that fact gives us a new perspective on the trials and storms that will come our way. It says that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He is growing and maturing you along the way. During the middle of that storm, during the middle of that trial, he is maturing and growing you. He's not leaving you or forsaking you, and he is doing that, and as he's doing that, he is walking with you every step of the way. And here's some more good news for you from the sovereignty of God. Knowing that he is the sovereign God over the universe, listen to this, will allow you to lay your head down at night and not worry about what tomorrow holds. 
It takes. Knowing that God is sovereign, this is what it does. It takes all the responsibility out of your hands, and it places it in the hands of the God that takes full responsibility for your well-being. Knowing that God is sovereign takes the fear away, and it frees you up to live the life he designed and has purpose for you. Do you have that kind of peace today? Can you rest knowing that God is in control of your life and your future and that everything that comes your way, it doesn't surprise him and he knows what to do in that situation? Do you have that kind of peace today? I encourage you tonight, rest well knowing that the sovereign God of the universe has it all under control. Father, we love you and we thank you. And we're so grateful and thankful that you know and nothing surprises you and you are in control of everything that happens and you're working towards your purposes and your plans. And we're just so thankful that being the sovereign God, that you are the good God also. And that as you are in control of our lives and this universe and your kingdom, you're working all things out for the good of those that love you. We love you and we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you next week as we continue on into the third attribute next week. Have a great week.